Uh, welcome, Jillian, and uh, you're here. You came all the way from the U.S., right? Berlin. From Berlin. Yeah. From Berlin. So um, the the purpose of this talk is really to just briefly go over Jillian's brilliant book, Silicon Values, uh, The Future of Free Speech Under Surveillance Capitalism, which basically links censorship and big tech in a nutshell. Uh, but it goes into much, much more uh, of that. Um, so I'm uh, Nurhan Kazak. I'm the English editor at Smex by day. I'm a poet by night. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I love words and I love reading. And I uh, was very excited to be here with Jillian and talk uh, to her about her book. You can all hear me in the back? OK. I feel like I'm screaming. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you the mic. OK. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's, thank you for being here. It's really, really special to me. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> and thank you for waiting. <laughs> yeah. So without further ado, let's dive into uh, the book. So silicon, silicon values. Why silicon values? What are the values that are uh, being born in the Silicon Valley? And what, what can you say about that? Um, yeah. So who's familiar with the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace? Anyone? OK. So there is this period of time in the 1990s where, and I mean, that still persists to today. I actually think that we're situated in a very interesting moment right now with Elon Musk buying Twitter <laughs> because it harkens back to this ideology, which is this ideology that was born in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, in the 1990s, um, promoting you know, libertarianism, uh, techno-utopianism, all of these ideas that technology was going to make the world better, that progress was inevitable, that, I mean, kind of the, the what is uh, Fukuyama's the end of history, that sort of thing, right? Um, we'll all be one, the singularity, we'll all be one with robots, et cetera, et cetera. And so the title, is, I mean, really just kind of an obvious play on words, um, that these values are silicon, that they're, they're, you know, they're not, uh, they're plastic, basically, that these values don't hold up. And I think that that's really what we've seen and what I've seen in doing this work. Um, when I came to, when I came to digital rights around 2000, God, oh God, no, I'm aging myself, seven, <laughs> eight, something like that, um, it felt like everything, like it felt like there was so much hope and really, really quickly, a lot of that collapsed. And a lot of that, from my perspective, collapsed because of the rise of these tech companies that have taken over our public spaces um, and you know, brought that under a capitalistic model. So yeah, that's where. And the, the subtitle, because I know yeah. you wanted me to comment on that. Yeah. Um, well, I, mean, I, I can't take credit for either. Somebody else helped me come up with the title and the subtitle, because it's not my, if you've ever worked with me, you know that I can't write titles and that I delegate that to everyone else. Um, but the future of free speech under surveillance capitalism I think is really just important to, um, to reference Shoshana Zuboff here, who wrote this book about surveillance capitalism, which of course is the, um, the practice of companies using our data to sell us back things to, um, yeah, to, to basically, uh, what's the word that I'm, extract from us. Um, and so I think that, that it's under that model that, th that all of these issues come to the fore. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's hard to imagine free speech under uh, capital, uh, under surveillance capitalism, it's almost impossible with these uh, very big companies owning the, as before they own the means of production, now they have the actual means of knowledge production that they also own at this time. All right, um, so the first three chapters cover the region, also they relate uh, all of this to the region. What can you tell us about how are we in this part of the world affected uh, by the silicon values that are plastic and just don't work? Yeah, so um, I don't know how many of you have read the book, and I see a lot of people who don't know me personally, so I'll, I'll go back just a little bit. Sorry for those of you who've known me for like 10 years. Yeah. This is going to be some boring history for you. <laughs> Um, so I started working in in this space, like working on um, government internet censorship and on campaigns for you know for people who'd been arrested for bloggers, etc. Back in like 2007, 2008, um, and then I started working at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, where 
I quickly learned that <laughs> free speech didn't work the way that I thought it did in the US. And I'm just being really honest with you. I was not, I, of course I knew the First Amendment, but I wasn't really familiar with, um, you know, we've talked about Section 230 yesterday, for those of you who are here. I didn't know the laws and I didn't understand what speech looked like on platforms. And so at that time, I was really connected to the Moroccan blogging community back then. Um, and one of the bloggers that I knew got in touch with me and said that he'd been censored by Facebook. And I didn't, like, uh, this was 2010, like, what does that mean, censored by Facebook? Um, and so we got to talking about it, and the story was basically that he had been advocating for the separation of education and religion, and his Facebook page had been taken down. And so when I started to dig into this, that's when I really learned that these platforms controlled, you know, they, they had the right to control and curate their own spaces, and that right's given to them by the First Amendment, and then of course they're also protected from liability under Section 230 or CDA 230, whatever you want to call it, in the US. But that obviously impacts people globally too, and it was only a matter of time before these other cases, um, <laughs> wink, started to come up. Uh, and then of course 2011, we all know what happened there, and the role that these platforms played there was, you know, that was talked about so much in the media, but then there was also this backside of it, this story that didn't really get told until later of important pages going down, being taken down because people were, um, you know, violating the rules in some meaningless way, like not uh, not using their real names, for example. I'm, I'm not telling you the whole story because it's in the book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, so all of that, but then also the fact that these platforms impose their own values on other societies. And in the region, what that, that has meant is in some ways, it's meant enabling hate speech and not having enough content moderators to deal with certain issues in Arabic, in other languages. I mean, I think Arabic is actually even better than a lot of other languages, frankly. Um, but it's also meant doing things like, one of my favorite stories from the book is when Microsoft Bing launched their search engine, they decided to block all terms related to the human body and sex in the region. And why did they do that? Because they had done market research in Saudi Arabia and the US UAE that gave them the determination that people didn't want to see those things. And so you, if you searched for breast cancer or chicken breast in 2010 on Bing, you couldn't get any results in Arabic. That's how bad it was and how algorithm, I mean, I guess not algorithmically, but automated uh, that it was at the time. And so, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of you know better than I do how the region is impacted by these decisions. But ultimately, the point that I like, that I want to make in the book is that the reason behind this is this ideology, this California ideology, this um, very silicon culture, let's say, um, where people are imposing their American values that came from this very specific place and time on the rest of the world. And I think it's, just to end that thought, I think it's really notable that a lot of the CEOs, Musk aside, him not being from the US originally, um, but Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, Sergey Brin, all of them are around the same age, grew up in the, around the same time period, came to California around the same time, and adopted this particular ideology while also bringing with them their own kind of American conservative values. <laughs> I'm very capitalistic. Thank you for that. And it's um, good you mentioned also Elon Musk and how he's playing, you know, with the platform right now and this, uh, like, uh, call for absolute free speech. But in reality, we know that this is not, uh, this is nothing uh, of what's really happening. Yeah, I mean, it's not only that the absolutism is a problem, because obviously he's putting aside the real dangers that exist on the platforms and pushing this, this absolutist ideology, but at the same time, he also said that his idea of free speech means adhering to the laws of the countries in which Twitter operates, which of course would mean censorship for a lot of people throughout the world, and often censorship that none of us would agree with, right? And so I think that that's what's really interesting. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you said playing with Twitter, because that is what he's doing. He's treating it like a playground. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to say something, uh, since you mentioned Arabic moderation, mm -hmm. and how in our region, it's not just about having people, let's say, that speak the dialect, it's also about having people who understand the nuances of every, of every region, and then in that region of every country, and even in every country, the different dialects that are spoken. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, for example, I could be saying something that on the surface could look totally uh, benign and there's nothing harmful about it. But if you understand the context from where it's coming, then it's something very, very derogatory or harmful. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in that uh, area to have people that actually understand the language, understand the culture, understand the context, to be able to moderate the, the content that's being put up there on uh, the platforms. Yeah. 
yeah, we don't have that. <laughs> We're not even close. Um, another question I wanted to ask you about the book, because I know you worked on it for a very long time, um, is how did you uh, gather your resources? What was the methodology of, uh, with which you approached writing the book? Uh, what was maybe the most difficult thing to get actually about uh, this book, like something that was almost impossible to get your hands on, but you really needed uh, for this book? Yeah, um, so I, you know, I've worked in this space for so long that a lot, of the, a lot of the stories came naturally. A lot of these were stories that I wanted to tell and I just had to find a way to situate them in history. So, I, well, I'll get to that, that bit later. Um, but I think the hardest, so a couple of the things that I did, one was like just relentlessly saving links. I use Zotero, I highly recommend it. Um, just relent, I mean, anyone in, in the room who's done like a PhD, for example, or written a book, you know what I'm talking about. So relentlessly saving and categorizing things. Um, I interviewed, Thankfully, like if there are people in this room I interviewed, I was able to interview a lot of incredible people. I don't even think I used all the material and recorded the interviews and transcribed them and went over them with a fine tooth comb. Um, and people are, you know, in this space give really great quotes. But I think the hardest part, honestly, was finding content moderators to talk to me. Mm -hmm. So through the years, I've gotten to know a lot of people who work at these companies, but they're usually policy staff. They're usually like somewhere in the middle to executive chain. Those people were willing to speak to me. I got to speak with like Nicole Wong and Alex McGilvray and all of these people who were high up at Twitter and Google. And that part was actually quite easy. Finding people who had worked in the teams in like Dublin or Manila or Austin, Texas or wherever the content moderators are based was nearly impossible. In the end, I was able to get three people, I believe. Um, and those three people were um, mostly from the, two out of three of them were from the region, which was thankfully, actually it was thanks to this community that I was able to find those people. Um, they're anonymous, so I can't tell you who they are, but it was, um, yeah, that was pretty, a pretty but incredible why experience. Why difficult to find them? Because they're terrified. So it's difficult to find them in the first place because their jobs are not public the way that like the executives' jobs are. They're sourced to other companies. They're sourced to other companies, yeah. So they're, yeah, I should go back to, yeah. So they're outsourced. Most of the companies employ third party um, uh, companies like Accenture, like Bertelsmann. Um, and through those companies, you have these people who are paid way less than they should be, not given enough psychosocial support. Because um, they can see yeah. some terrifying Yeah, I mean, they're looking at child sexual abuse imagery, yeah. they're looking at um, violent attacks, yeah. they're looking at hate speech all day, and th it's one of the hardest jobs, I think, in the world right now. Yeah, and their time. They have maybe 40 seconds or 30 seconds to make a decision. Exactly. A video of gore and guts and blood, and sometimes people even committing suicide live. Exactly. Which is very traumatizing for these people and they don't have any support. No, and then they're also made to sign a non-disclosure agreement so they're terrified to speak to you. And that's why that was so hard to do. Um, and the stories they shared with me, I mean I understand why they have to sign these things, not that I agree with it, um, but one of the stories in there was somebody who said that she had seen, and I, I don't want to traumatize anyone so I won't give details, but that she had seen some things coming from Libya that she was told to just delete and put in the bin. And that these things could have constituted like um, documentation of human rights violations, but she was not allowed to preserve them in any way. Yeah, war. I mean, they could have been war crimes. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, um, okay. Uh, my last question. I think we're we're good on time. Oh, we're good on time. We have some time. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about your uh, the the chapter that you think is most relevant to what is happening now in the world. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the list. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I do know my own book. It's just, it's, it's been a long pandemic. Um, so, okay, so I think that the most relevant right now is probably chapter four, Profit Over People, for very obvious reasons. Um, I, that gives a lot of the history of the platforms um, particularly in the region actually, a lot of the, the, when they started moving to the UAE, why they started throwing away their values, because early on they were willing to help us. Early on a lot of the platforms were willing to have conversations with us that they are not now. Um, and so yeah, I think that that one's the most relevant and you had, I know you had another. Yeah, I also wanted to ask you about your favorite chapter, the one maybe you enjoyed writing the most or found, you've learned something exceptional in it. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna flip to it actually. Yeah, um, you can pick into your own book. Know, <laughs> you I wrote know. it. <laughs> so, okay, my favorite 
um, is chapter six, 21st century Victorians. Um, because one of the things that I found really difficult, I've been really interested over the years in why nudity is censored on platforms, why like the human body, especially women's bodies, are censored. And I think that like right now it's even more troubling because now that we're having you know a less binary understanding of gender, that line is even more difficult for companies and they're getting it so badly wrong. Um, even though I think you know the rules for women's bodies are unfair too. So when it came to writing about that, I was I was really like struck by how that argument hasn't really resonated with people over the years. I speak about it at conferences and people will come up to me and say like, oh yeah, I mean, okay, whatever, but why aren't you talking about like political censorship? Yeah, okay, both are important though. Um, and I think that the ways in which platforms, you know, decide what is acceptable in terms of the human body, I think but that matters. Exactly. Inherently political. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so writing that, I, I, got, I had started researching and I realized that it it was just, it fit perfectly with um, Victorianism. And so I wrote it in the context of uh, Victorianism and like the, the history of the fig leaf, which I won't get into right now, it's in the book, but if any of you know it, I, I think is really fascinating. Um, and so I think, yeah, that was the most fun chapter to write. Yeah? Yeah, because it just, it required me to like think outside of the, the digital rights box and write about something I didn't really know that much about. <laughs> and because also the digital box does seep into everything. And yeah. Everything back into it. Exactly. But maybe someone here knows the history of the fig leaf um, that covered the genital organs of... <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mean, the, the short version in the <laughs> Queen Victoria was such a prude that they had to cover the statues, they had to cover the male genitalia so that she wouldn't have to see it. Um, and so that's where like the this idea of Victorianism comes, well, part of it anyway, it comes from. And that was really interesting to me that like the, the historic fig leaf is partially just so that this, this prude wouldn't have to look at these things, which is exactly what I think of when I think of like Mark Zuckerberg, is that he doesn't like it and so we have to suffer under his particular set of rules. That's just my, my imagination of how it works anyway. That's because you don't We play by their rules. I mean, an executive, I, I quoted it in the book, an executive from Facebook once said to me that I, I asked, you know, point blank, maybe over a few drinks, why is it that we can't see women's breasts? And she said, oh, because that's all that would be on the feed all the time. And I was like, that's literally the reason? Like, why is that? <laughs> okay. It says a lot about society much more than uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. like, trying to hide something that's so present and that people are obsessed with. When there's something wrong, <laughs> there's something not right happening. Um, I think we're good with the questions for now. I would like to open up uh, the stage for whoever would like to ask a question. Please raise your voice a little bit. Uh, uh, all right. So, uh, I mean, I, I know you've been working on this for a while, long before, I mean, you've been working in content meditation for a while, long before you started writing a book. And I've been to talks and uh, sat with sessions in, with you. What I'm wondering is when you started writing the book and while you were writing it, how much was new to you? How much did you feel that you were discovering things that uh, you, know, you hadn't before? I think that's the most fun part of writing a book, honestly, because I, I I never thought I knew everything, but I did. I felt like I knew a lot, and then when I started to get into the rabbit hole, specifically with relation to certain countries that I hadn't really worked in, so like Myanmar, for example. I mean, mm -hmm. I think people are familiar with that story, which is absolutely horrifying. But there was so much that I didn't know, and when I, I talked to some people from the country, I you know read a lot, read other people's works on that. That was one of the examples of something where it just blew my mind. Another one was looking at the history of harassment and actually realizing how much my views had changed from earlier things I'd written about how companies should deal with harassment. And when I interviewed people and I looked at some of the history around that, it was, yeah, there was just so much that, um, that I hadn't seen going on under the surface. And I think that that's kind of a reminder to ourselves in this space. And I know obviously now this is a much bigger space. When I started going to these conferences, we were like 20 people, not this one, but you know, uh, 2011. Yes. Even this, yeah, maybe even this one. I mean, I, that's, yeah. So I think it's kind of like a reminder to to remember to hear all of those different perspectives as you go, because otherwise you'll be writing a book and then go, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy for the people who came to me and said, you know what, I think that you got this wrong back in the day and like, let's, yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? Would someone, yeah. I can shout. Uh -huh. um, we need to, to speak to the Shout, but in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we need to record this. Thank you. 
<laughs> um, so Jillian, I haven't read your book as I told you earlier yet, but uh, question, you were saying, because um, you and I have been doing this for a long time together, um, and you were saying that, uh, you know, at, at the beginning, you know, platforms were sort of more on our side, they were more willing to help. And I'm wondering where you see that inflection point. And in particular, I'm wondering if in your research, and I know that this is maybe beyond the scope of your book, but um, if you started seeing more collaboration, collusion um, between companies and governments at that inflection point, and what do you think that looks like and what do we do? No, I wouldn't do that. Toss it. It's yeah. soft, no? um, and it won't do the feedback thing. Okay, so um, if I understood correctly, yeah. So I, when I first started talking with the companies, I think it was like I, my first conversation with Facebook was because they found a blog post that me, like little old blogger me who had like 100 views a day max, um, they'd found something I'd written criticizing them about the, the anti-anonymity rule and reached out to me. And I mean, that was just, oh, they're that small that somehow I'm important enough, right? cut to a few years later and I so strange to compete with um, I think that I think that the the turning point was 2014 ish and I would say that it's because of the confluence of three factors one is um, the just deluge of smartphones right so more people using platforms because they have access to them every day the second one is Isis um, the the reaction that platforms had to the Islamic State and um, and other you know other groups as well but there was there was a, if like if, if you weren't working in this space then it's hard to maybe remember it, but you had President Obama calling, like calling the platforms to censor more, which is strange in a US context um, that you would have a president doing that. And then the third one is the rise of harassment on the platforms and Gamergate, which happened around the same time. So Gamergate, the rise of the Islamic State and the smartphone, all of that was 2014-15. And was there a, and algorithms, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think that's another, like the, the um, develop me, development of technology and the fact that platforms could use automation to take down things um, made it so much easier. And yeah, I mean, I think the other factor there too, which is in the, the fourth chapter, is that these companies threw away their values when they opened up their offices in Dubai and we knew it and we told them not to and they did it anyway. I mean, I, was, I remember being on a call in I'm not going to remember the year, but it was probably 2015, um, with a bunch of people from Human Rights Watch, from organiz other organizations, with Twitter, and us begging them not to open their office there, and them being like, it's fine, we did a human rights assessment. <laughs> Which, by the way, Google also said to me on stage earlier this year when we asked them about the data centers, in I think Mohammed actually asked the question, but about the data centers in Saudi Arabia, and the guy was like, oh, you know, Global Network Initiative, like, we, we did a, a human rights impact assessment, and I said, excuse me, but you can't do a human rights impact assessment on a country that, like, beheads journalists, like, that just, that isn't a thing. Um, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, does that answer your question? Is that good? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so thinking of Web3, the decentralized web, and especially now discussions about Mastodon, do you see these same silicon values being applied to these this kind of new space? Is there like a shift in values that's even more capitalistic and awful? So I'm going to take off my, well, okay, I'm, I'm speaking from, not for my organization right now, just to be really clear, because I, I do think that my, my personal views differ a little bit from EFFs, and so I just want to make that abundantly clear before I say what I'm about to say. Yeah, and we um, forgot to mention that you're the director of International Free, uh, Freedom of Speech in the Electronic Foundation. Yes, yeah. although I'm, I'm not speaking in that capacity so much, um, but, they, but they're, I mean, we are a free speech organization and I have the right to speak freely on these things. I just have to say, hey, not, you know, speaking for myself here. Um, so I, I think like most of Web3 is garbage, um, per <laughs> personally. <laughs> That said, I mean, I want to like I want to be really real about Mastodon because I think that like as as Twitter falls apart, people are moving there, and so we do have to take it realistically that this is a space that people are engaging in. I don't think it's all bad. It's obviously not a one-to-one -one replacement for Twitter. It can't be. Um, but the values, 
I do see a shift, right? So it's not, it's not identical values. It's not the same 1990s Californian ideology. It's the people creating this are rooted in a more, let's say, updated, modern version of American progressivism that is perhaps a little bit more tied to centrism or even, um, yeah, I would say more tied to like US, like we're, no, I'm saying this wrong, like left centrism in the US rather than this like this right wing libertarianism that I think a lot of these other companies are rooted in. Um, that said, I mean, I, I'm not sure that that's a great mix either from some of the things I've seen so far on certain servers and some of the comments that I've seen from, um, yeah, from some of the, the Mastodon people about how they want to how they want to deal with content, how they're dealing with I mean, the, the ways in which they're dealing with data. And I'm no expert on the Fediverse, I'm, I, so I'm a little nervous talking about this because I think there are some people who know more than me in this room. Um, but yeah, I, I do worry that the values that they're, that they're bringing aren't really much better. And I'm not really sure how we solve this because I think that the right has found their platforms. The central, the middle is kind of dying. The centralized platforms are dying. And then where do we go? How do we gather? Um, yeah, I think that's kind of still an open question. Question for the future. <laughs> um, yeah. So, hi. Uh, I haven't read your book yet, but my, for, I would love to, honestly. Uh, my question is, is there any alternative values to the silicon values? And is there any technology that would satisfy these alternative values? I mean, I'm personally, my personal beliefs are that we have to look towards international human rights frameworks because that's what we have. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't update them, but that's what we have as a, as a global society. And I think that that's where a lot of these companies have gone wrong is pulling away from that. Um, they are trying, there are efforts behind this, right? Facebook has a human rights team, Twitter had a human rights team until like two weeks ago. Um, Reddit is, is really like, has made a lot of progress toward, um, toward implementing a lot of the, you know, a lot of these values. Um, there, yeah, I mean, I think though at the same time, we, we like, we're in a new, this is a new generation. This is a new era. Like, I think that a lot of the conversations are being had here and at the other, you know, other regional conferences that I've been to this year. I was in, uh, in Zambia earlier, in uh, Sarajevo, and like, it's, you know, it's the same kind of group of people having these conversations somewhere else in the world. Um, so A, bring us all together. I think we could figure it out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I also don't want to impose my personal values on what the best idea is. And that's where I kind of leave the end of the book is saying that like, I'm not the one who's ultimately going to decide this. I mean, no one individually is, but I think that we have to be having this conversation outside of the existing elite systems that we already have and bring it to the people. And how do we do that? I mean, God, if I knew, like, <laughs> I wish I knew. Yeah, and we can't forget that yeah. whatever values are coming out of these platforms or corporations, or com uh, no, it's, they're coming out of an already existing system mm -hmm. that yeah. has these uh, values uh, very much upheld. So changing the values of the platforms requires us to actually change the world that we're living in to be able to match it. But the world will continue to create these silicon values as long as we live in a capitalist, uh, elitist world. Exactly, yeah, and so then we have to decide, do we want to build from the ground up? Do we want to reform? I've always worked toward reforming what we have, and I think that any platform coming out now, like they have they have a whole bunch of frameworks that they can look to, not just UN frameworks, but we also have like the Santa Clara principles that we came up with a couple years ago with a global community. There's a lot of frameworks that they can look to, and the fact that they're, they're choosing not even to do that with what we have so far is what scares me. And so, yeah, I think that's that's the conversation that we need to have. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, fair. Yeah, we have a minute. Excuse me. Uh, so you mentioned how uh, difficult it is to decide on a set of values, and of course it is, but uh, in general, like in our modern community, we have a solution for this, and it is procedural. Uh, our, uh, the most obvious solution for this would be a procedural solution, just democratizing the platforms. And is it possible with the current ownership model? And isn't this kind of the problem? Like, isn't it insane just one person can buy Twitter and destroy it? And how we are allowing it as a community? Just Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we, 
people, I mean, we, I say we like collectively, there's what, hundreds of people, thousands of people in the digital rights community in these companies and nobody's come up with the right solution. And that's why I don't want to like sit here and like, you know, I don't have the ego to say that I have the solution for this. I think that finding a way to democratize these platforms is harder than it looks, but I do think it is what we have to do. And of course, I don't think a CEO should be able to make these decisions. I think, you know, I have to like give some credit because we know that A, because they're here in the room, but also because I think that the Facebook Oversight Board is creating a really interesting conversation around what this could look like and how you could bring other people into the into the conversation about you know how to deal with how to um, what's the word that I'm looking for like how to deal with cases around speech but ultimately like that can't scale it's I don't think it can scale and so I think that it's a piece of the puzzle but we have to we have to create you know we have to look at like all of these different pieces of the puzzle and right now the solution or right now the situation that we have is unelected dictators making rules about what we can say and then like an underclass of people throughout the world in, and particularly a lot of vulnerable people working in these positions as content moderators and censoring things so that we, the elite, ultimately don't have to look at them and that's unsustainable. It's never been sustainable. So we definitely have to kill that system. What comes next is I think the question that we are all here to answer, yeah? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jillian. This was a super lovely, uh, enriching conversation. And uh, for anyone who'd like to get the book, we have them being sold here. Jillian can sign some copies between now and the next around, like find her around and let her sign the copy for you. And you can also find it online. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, if you, if you really, if you can't afford it or you really dig, I'm sure that there's a free PDF out there. If you want to buy it online though, um, go to Verso Books, uh, the website. I think that's the most affordable place to get it in paperback, but there's also an audio and an ebook uh, and it's EPUB format, so it's compatible with all your devices. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Thank you and thank you for listening.